So, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tiana um, Sakuraya, and I'm here today attempting to add any bit of clarity I can for those of you who want to understand more about the mainstream media's coverage of the Syrian conflict over the past six years. Of course, many of the things I'll say or mention have already been covered or touched upon by the remarkable speakers that have spoken before me, particularly Susie here as well. Um, and to be honest, this is my first time doing anything like this or even speaking in front of an audience any bigger than my high school English class. <laughs> so I'm by no means an expert on the political nuances of this war, but I hope to utilise my passions, my frustrations, and my, the experiences of my family on the ground in Syria, um, some of which recently came to Australia and are in the room today, um, to do what I can to expose the truth. Good. So by being given the opportunity... <laughs> By being given the awesome opportunity I have made today, I can only hope to put forth a new perspective that can help us generally understand the role of different media platforms in the war on Syria and the tactics our media use to subvert the narrative of the Syrian war as part of a greater agenda. So the eruption of the Syrian conflict in 2011 saw the development of not only the most documented and photographed war in human history, but also the collapse of the integrity of Western media outlets and corporate institutions whose injection of poisonous agendas into their coverage of the conflict have escalated the devastating war. They've also facilitated blind acceptance <coughs> of Western interventionism in the Middle East by means of proxy Islamist death spots. The substance of this war, and of any war for that matter, when it comes down to it, relies on three things. Denial, fraud, and fabrication. The denial of basic realities and international law, the fraudulent framing of key events, and finally, the fabrication of larger narratives. Also, I apologise for this visual. It does seem a bit intense, but that's supposed to reflect how we are bombarded constantly um, with this propaganda every day. So American scholar Brene Brown once summed up the power of the corporate media when it comes to crisis reporting. She says, It's in our biology to trust what we see with our eyes. This makes living in a carefully edited, overproduced and photoshopped world very dangerous. And when looking at the war on Syria, we see just that. One elaborate production. And an overarching dichotomy between what is real and what our governments need us to think is real up there on the top in order for them to pursue their hegemonic, hegemonic agenda with pristine optics. Keeping on with that motif of production, of illusion and of deception, you can't have a narrative without having structural techniques that allow for a larger story to maintain a sense of integrity. Thus, we have the premise of my perspective today, Syrian MacGuffin. Okay, I know many of you are wondering, A, what is a MacGuffin? And B, how could such a ridiculous sounding word have any place in discussing this war? Well, I'm here to break down this peculiar term and show you how it actually has a very real and practical application when it comes to understanding how the media indirectly propagates Western imperialist doctrines. A MacGuffin, a term coined by Alfred Hitchcock in 1939, in fiction, is a plot device in the form of some goal, desired object, or abstract ideal that the protagonist, or in this case, the moral proposition of public opinion as facilitated by public media, pursues. In simple words, the trigger for the plot. By the end of a narrative, the MacGuffin becomes typically unimportant to the overall plot and loses its significance as <coughs> the events of the story unfold. Now let us put aside the ranging political perspective surrounding this war and just focus for now on framing the Syrian conflict as a basic narrative. By doing this, it becomes clear how Western media utilizes, through sentimentalized journalism, the quest for freedom, peace, and human rights as a means to justify its prolonging of the bloodshed in Syria for its regime change agenda. So much so that the concept of humanitarianism, humanitarianism is now nothing but a MacGuffin, an evocative sounding but ultimately disposable plot device for Western imperialism and its long-term plan for regional transformation. Today I'm going to split my presentation into two key media strategies that manifest the ways in which imperialist forces facilitate this humanitarian MacGuffin and deceive consumers of mainstream media. These strategies are A, selective sentiment and the politicization of compassion and B, the whitewashing of terrorist agendas and the provision of a media platform for terrorist organizations under the farce of creating a moderate opposition. Firstly, we have selective sentiment. Sorry about the... Uh, which refers to how the corporate media capitalizes on human emotion 
to not only cover up its destructive foreign policy that has led to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people in this conflict, but also as a warmongering device. They want to keep the tape rolling on their imperial plans, and in order to do that, the West has adopted a sick type of savior complex, as um, Susie referred to earlier, that pushes for larger scales of humanitarian intervention. Compassion has been politicized in this, in this conflict through a media framework that selectively covers casualties and so-called rescue <coughs> operations from sources and perspectives allied with extremist US-backed countries on the ground in Syria. Um, obviously, the most prominent example of this is the White Helmets. Um, they, di they dictate to us whose lives matter. They not only tell us who we should weep for, but how we should harness our emotion to advocate for more war. How we should intervene for Amran, because no child should grow up seeing nothing but war. But we should ignore these innocent people and children because their faces and names did not reach our headlines. Because the perpetrators of their deaths are the same rebels that we trained and funded. Now, if I return to the fact that the Syrian war is and has been the most um, sorry, one second. Yeah. Now, if I return to the fact that the Syrian war is and has been the most photographed and documented war in human history, I ask the question: At what cost is this so? When we analyse the effects of dishonest visual media on mass consumers, we are given insight into how the manipulation, fabrication, and distribution of false images and videos are tools used on a worldwide scale to whitewash and propagate the terrorist deluge in Syria. French philosopher Jacques Ellul asserts that the psychological warfare is the hardest war tactic to defend against because no international court of justice is capable of protecting against psychological aggression. Okay, I'm sure many of you have seen the exploited image of this little girl before. Barna Alibet became a figure who emerged on social media during the battle and liberation of Aleppo. This innocent face here is the epitome of how our Qaeda linked rebels facilitated by their monopoly over the sentiments of Western digital media, labor the persona of a young child as a figurehead of the warmongering effort. Her Twitter account, set up to document the siege on Aleppo, as we all now know now is a complete fraud, goes to show the extent that the opposition will go to, that is, child abuse, to war for more war. There is probably nothing more upsetting than the up exploitation and employment of children in this dirty war, particularly by the Western media. Let's take a look at Aylan Kobe, the three-year-old Syrian boy whose image made global headlines after he drowned in the Mediterranean Sea on the 2nd of September in 2015, fleeing from the war. And now look at the subsequent front page by UK-based newspaper The Sun. For Aylan, they suggest, we should send more bombs, create more destruction. This event sparked a thought process that to avenge his death or to avenge the suffering of refugees, we must engage in more war, as if war is for the people. War is never for the people. The modernization of justice for Syria, peddled by the media politicizing where we should focus our compassion, inherently com communicates how actual foreign policies and principles of politicians don't matter to their supporters. It only matters that in the destructive quest to obtain those imperial policies, the supposed <coughs> heroes, or our moderate head-chopping rebels, mm. defeat the villains, which is the Syrian government defending its sovereignty. It's all about the narrative, the emotions, and what political commentators cynically call the optics. Through images and propaganda, we can see exactly how the media have framed their beloved heroes and sinister villains, and how such propaganda correlates with this greater scheme for regime change, destabilization, and the erasure of Syrian sovereignty. Okay. Even more so than visual propaganda, language has also played a detrimental role in the coverage of Syria. Uh, I think Susie referred to this earlier, earlier as well. Trigger words are utilized to almost cheerlead the humanitarian government. Particularly in the digital age, where infamous hashtags are weapons that cloud critical and fair investigation into the events they aim to distort. Popular hashtags that trended around the time of Aleppo's liberation last year were absolute, absolutely detached from re the reality on the ground, where government forces and their allies were defeating al-Qaeda affiliated groups who besieged the town in 2012. Hashtag Aleppo is burning. Hashtag save Aleppo. Hashtag Aleppo has fallen. Hashtag Aleppo genocide. Now tell me which of these images testify to the media's coverage of the so-called massacre in Aleppo. The house-to-house -house murder of civilians. The mass slaughters and rapes. Which of these images show us the fall of Aleppo? The one where a member of the Syrian Arab army carries an elderly lady on his back as evacuations of eastern Aleppo are made? Or is it maybe the picture of Christians celebrating Easter for the first time in five years? I'll let you decide. Moving on, let's look at the
strategy number two in this meeting is dirty information war in Syria. The media actively participates in the whitewashing of terrorist agendas and the provision of a media platform for terrorist organizations under the farce of creating a moderate opposition. On July 28, the Qatari-based Al Jazeera, of course, because we can't get enough of Al Jazeera today, <laughs> and an address by Jabhat al nusra's leader, Mohammed Jalani, who said that the group is changing its name to Jabhat Fatah al Sham and its official flag from black to white, <coughs> thank gosh. This <laughs> formal disassociation from Al-Qaeda aimed to portray the group as moderate opposition within a nationalist narrative, enabling them to maintain strong popular support from Western and Gulf states. I'll just play a small clip of this. في قصفهم وتشريدهم لعامة المسلمين في الشام بحجة استهداف جبهة النصرة التابعة لتنظيم قاعدة الجهاد فقد قررنا إلغاء العمل باسم جبهة النصرة وإعادة تشكيل جماعة جديدة ضمن جبهة عمل تحمل اسم جبهة فتح الشام علما أن هذا التشكيل الجديد ليس له علاقة بأي جهة خارجية <تصفيق> Okay, so it's pretty straightforward. It's the leader of a terrorist organization being given a platform, initially by Al Jazeera and later on by CNN, to announce a tactical rebranding under the name, under the name Jabhat Fatah al-Shem. We are expected to believe that a new name is synonymous with a shift from the group's radical, violent and sectarian ideologies. These, Salaf these Salafi ideologies are the ones that dominate the military opposition in Syria. Surprisingly, I think William Shakespeare analogizes this particular event rather well. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. So I say, what's in a name? That which we call a terrorist by any other name would smell as foul, evil, and depraved. <laughs> it is nothing short of <laughs> disgusting and hypocritical that the media allows such a platform, which does nothing but bury the fact that the true threat to Syrians does not lie in the fake narrative of a government massacring its own people. Rather, it lies in a deceptive, rather it lies in deceptive propaganda that sugarcoats the role of terrorist organizations in, in the destruction of Syria. I'm not too sure anymore what is still allow, allowing Western states this false sense of moral authority, or even more so, affording them a public sense of legitimacy and credibility in the stories our media circulate. We have seen time and time again how that as the values and agendas of corporate institutions evolve according to foreign policy, so too does the, depi the depiction of ground events in Syria. At each corner we see the imperialist narrative crumbling, and somewhere further down the same path, yep, you guessed it, a narrative shift, a re-establishment of priorities, a constantly evolving web of deception fueled by the demonization of a sovereign government. It's an absurd case that peddles a cartoonishly ignorant disposition. Does anyone know the game of... Bloody Mary, it's usually in horror movies. Oh, yes. yeah. It's kind of like that, as if somehow if they repeat the words chemical weapons or genocide or Aleppo's last hospital destroyed three times in the mirror, a bloodthirsty vill villainous Bashar al Assad is going to pop out with a resignation letter and a whole class to annex Syrian land, destabilize the population, and seize Syrian resources. When you control what the masses consume as truth, just like the Western media does, then you also have the power to manipulate what the masses see as falsehoods, conspiracy theories, treacheries. I guess that's where many of the voices you have heard over the past two days fit in, according to the deceitful popular media. This very notion is obviously unacceptable, and we must never stop challenging, debating, and fiercely exposing the facts and the reality of what's happening on the ground in Syria. Even if, sometimes, it feels like there is no room for intellectual debate with people who cannot or will not admit that there are things which need to be discussed. And that is perhaps the biggest frustration and most upsetting tragedy that befalls the information war that we are faced with today. The fact that many institutions, voices of reason and logic, as well as individual experiences, are silenced by those who control content creation and distribution. The silence of justice in modern times is drowned out by imperialist Zionist corporations who scream out words like peace and freedom down the camera lens and gain pleasure in knowing that the only echoes that reverberate are those of war, greed and hegemony behind the camera. Alfred Hitchcock liked to call it the MacGuffin, a mysterious objective in a narrative that sets the whole chain of events into, into motion. But despite the supposed centrality of the MacGuffin, whether it be human rights, freedom or peace, just like this war, a Hitchcock movie is always about something else. Thank you.